light. Do you realize that 80% of the information our brains process comes through our eyes in the form of light? A photograph is the freezing of light in a moment of time. Photography, then, is seeing and capturing an instant of light in a river of time. I could stand up here and tell you how I created this, or what I was thinking when I created this, and pass on some of the techniques over the 30 years of photography experience that I have, but I won't. Because sometimes when I'm photographing, all I see are patterns of light and patterns of action. Explaining it would be very difficult for me to do in the amount of time I have today. So instead, I'm gonna share some of my real passions and four of the lessons they have taught me in life. For you see, just like some of you, have aptitudes for music or numbers or languages, I found out at an early age that I have an affinity for seeing light. And since photography is light, it's been more of a tool for me rather than a passion. My real passions are adventure and exploration of nature, of people, of places. Soon after college, I began following those passions, armed with a backpack, a camera, a few dollars, and a willingness to work at anything to reach the next destination. By the age of 25, I was a seasoned traveler, having crossed oceans on a sailboat, swam with sharks, climbed pyramids in far off lands. I was physically at the top of my game. I felt immortal. Time held little meaning. I was fearless and seriously in need of some humility, which soon arrived on a cliff in the cold far north. Halfway between Iceland and Scotland lies a windswept rocky archipelago called the Faroe Islands. These 17 tiny islands rise out of the North Atlantic just south of the Arctic Circle. This means little sunlight in the winter, little darkness in the summer, no trees, no crops. What they do have is hundreds of thousands of seabirds which feed on the rich North Atlantic waters and nest on the rocky cliffs. The greatest concentration of seabirds is on the westernmost island of Michinez, which is a barren, steep-sided rock continually pounded by North Atlantic waves. Wanting to explore this island, I caught the once-a-week ferry, which carries food, hardware, and people to the island. There's a young married couple named Bjorn and Emma that kindly offered to host me for the week. They raised sheep and hunted birds for a living. My first meal with Bjorn and Emma was dried fish, dried whale, and dried blubber, yum. <laughs> Bjorn talked of how harsh life could be on Michinez with the cold winds, the lack of blue skies, the thick fog. And he ended the conversation with a warning. He looked me directly in the eyes and he said, listen carefully, Tony, do not hike the western edge of the island alone. The cliffs are steep, the fog rolls in quickly, easy to lose your way and fall into the sea 300 feet below. Sure, I said without really listening, that night, Lying in bed, all I could think about was hiking the western cliffs and photographing the birds. <laughs> the next morning, Bjorn and Emma took me bird hunting, but instead of a gun, they took a net and a rope. We headed west, climbed up a steep path along a sheer cliff for about an hour. At the end of the path was a thin post pounded into the cliffside. Bjorn inched his way out and tied himself to the post. Emma and I stood on relatively more stable ground about 15 feet away. Then we passed in the net. I looked up and saw seagull-sized birds called foamers soaring over the cliff. As a foamer glided directly over his head, Bjorn gracefully swept the net up and captured the bird in mid-flight. Then he rotated the net, locking the bird in, and lowered it down to Emma, who grabbed the bird and snapped its neck. In 20 minutes, they had harvested 10 birds. On the way home with his bulging burlap bag of birds dangling from his shoulder, Bjorn told stories of how bird hunting in Michigan is an old tradition. It was once a necessity of survival in a land that didn't grow crops, and he wanted to keep that technique alive just in case. He ended with, don't be fooled by how easy I made that look. Netting birds is a dangerous proposition. Many men have died when the rope broke or they slipped off the cliff. Once again, I was deaf to their warning, and the following morning, I left the house early before Emma and Bjorn woke up. With camera, water, and lunch in my backpack, I headed for, where else? The forbidden western cliffs. <laughs> the day was clear of fog as I headed west, up and over the island, stopping at these fantastic geologic formations for a couple of selfies, we would call them today. 
After lunch, the trail began to get steeper, and I failed to notice that visibility had dropped, that the fog was moving in. The trail turned into a small path, and the land tilted to near vertical. I began having to use my hands against the cliff face as I walked, shuffling my feet sideways along some parts of the path. Then the fog closed in. I couldn't see more than a foot ahead or behind. I slid one foot sideways, knocking some gravel down the steep cliff, and then I froze. I was starting to slip. I could feel the panic rising in my gut, the increase in breathing, my heartbeat racing. My fingers were turning white from just grabbing onto the cliff ice so hard. And as my feet slowly began slipping, it hit me. I was going to fall. Then I heard a sound above me, a swish of tiny wings. I gently tilted my head up, and I saw a puffin, one of the most beautiful birds I've ever seen, sitting on a ledge just about a foot above me, tilting his head one way, then the other, looking at me like, what's this big stupid beast doing? <laughs> then the puffin was gone. And I noticed the fog had momentarily cleared, and I realized I could grab the same ledge that the puffin was sitting on to swing up and over to safety. So a lack of respect for my environment, a lack of respect for the knowledge and experience of my host, and more, a lack of respect for myself had nearly cost me my life. I believe many young people are faced with similar situations in life where a lack of experience or thought will put their life in danger or end it. Many years ago, Henry Bowman, my brother-in-law, then a big, strong, and love with life young person like many of you here today, made a bad decision. He drank some alcohol, decided to drive from Dangriga to Belmopan, and crashed. He never regained consciousness and died seven years later. I was lucky. Henry wasn't. I realized in the moment on that cliff that I was not something special or unique, that I was much a part of nature as that puffin, and just as fragile. Time suddenly had meaning and an end. Lesson number one, the experience had taught me a newfound respect for life, my life, and how fragile it is. A few years after the cliff adventure, I visited the Faroe Islands again, this time for almost nine months. I had made so many friends during my first visit that I wanted to go back and document and learn more about the history and daily life of these seafaring people. During my stay, I experienced a very old tradition which again challenged my meaning of respect. The Faroe Islands were first colonized by the Vikings in the 8th century, right about the same time of the height of the Maya civilization here in Belize. Fortunately for these Vikings, the waters around the Faroes support large numbers of long fin pilot whales. The first whale hunt in the Faroes is registered in Old Norse records from 1298. From that day forward, the pilot whale has held a central place in the life of the everyday Faroese. Whale hunts continue today but they are non-commercial by law, and they're organized on a community level. I found out up close how these hunts work. When a sizable pod of whales is sighted offshore, hunters slowly approach the pilot whales with a wide semicircle of boats, and they begin throwing small stones tied the line out in front of the boat, reeling it in, throwing it out, and what that does is it creates a virtual wall of sound and bubbles, and they slowly drive the pilot whales into a bay. As the whales reach shallow water, the slaughter begins. Trained and licensed harpooners will thrust a lance into the back of the neck of the whale, severing the spinal cord. The slaughter is dangerous and horrific, but it's over quickly. Immediately after the kill, tractors haul the carcasses up the beach. The whales are quickly measured and marked according to traditions worked out over the centuries and carefully butchered so little is wasted. Within hours, the tide takes out the remain, and by the next day, there is little evidence of a kill, except every family in the community has a freezer full of whale meat and blubber. At first, I was horrified and disgusted by this, but weeks of discussion with friends shined a light on another way of looking at these killings. Remember when I said the Faroese have no trees or crops? Imagine. How hard it must have been to live there throughout the centuries, scraping a living from just catching fish, harvesting seabirds, and raising sheep. Starvation was always a bad hunting or fishing day away. The whales were a gift, not a business, not a raping of a resource, but a necessity up until the mid-20th century. One successful hunt could hold off starvation for months. 
This is an important cultural tradition of the Faroese. But it is also a skill that may be needed in the future, should the lifeline of food transportation ever disappear. One generation is all it would take to lose the skill and knowledge to harvest whales. I understand how hard this is to look at, let alone accept. But think, if starvation threatened you, threatened your family, threatened your community, would you kill a whale to eat? Imagine in Belize if we forgot how to grow crops, or how to fish, or how to hunt. I soon realized that traditions have a value to cultures that people outside that culture cannot see because they have no frame of reference in which to place it. But if we take the time to understand, to know the reason for these traditions, we can learn to respect the differences between people. This need for understanding and respect is critical in a multicultural society like ours. Probably the most visible cultural divide today in Belize is between the centuries-old traditions of our Maya people versus the modern capitalist system which drives our economy today. The very essence of the Maya's life is the cultivation of communal lands and the traditions upon which these lands are governed. The Maya do not reject modern ways outright. They just demand the right to enter the modern era on their terms, with their spiritualism and culture intact. Lesson number two, once we take the time and effort to shed some light on a struggle, on any people's struggle, we can begin to understand and respect the rights of a people to their ways, to be different. And in Belize, we must not only respect the right of a people to be different, but remain united while doing so. Now we turn to Belize and my work today, documenting my country. I first came to Belize over 30 years ago working with the Smithsonian Institution's Marine Lab on the Barrier Reef. Being under the sea was my life. The coral reef, my sanctuary. My photography reflected this. I took my camera underwater much more than above. Since then, photography has allowed me to not only visit, but support many wild places in the country, above and below water. Working with organizations like the Belize Zoo, the Belize Audubon Society, Yashe, Oceana, and Wild Tracks has shown me the beauty and fragility of our natural resources as well as how lucky we are to have dedicated individuals that care deeply about conserving our natural world. One organization I have worked closely with is Friends for Conservation and Development, known as FCD, the non-governmental organization tasked with protecting our spectacular Chicabo Forest. Documenting the stunning beauty of this part of Belize has been my most recent work. But working beside some of the most dedicated yet unheralded Belizeans, my honor. I recently participated in an FCD expedition, kayaking down a remote river in the Chiquibul, passing through an unexplored area named Solitaire Canyon. Three FCD rangers, two highly experienced bush guides, and myself as photographer, trusted our experience, our equipment, and each other to explore the unknown. We kayaked past massive cliffs and overhangs, shot over rapids, and explored caves that held sheltered artifacts for centuries. We were also always wet and always aware that danger could lie around the next bend in the river. One day we came to a huge boulder field blocking our way and then it began to rain. The danger of flash flood or injury from a fall on the limestone became real. After a short discussion, we unloaded the kayaks and carried everything through the boulder field only to find that the river entered a cave. So we reloaded the kayaks, paddled through the cave, and we came upon a second boulder field, and again had to unload and pass over the treacherous limestone. Five hours later, exhausted and hungry, we made camp with this view in the evening. There is a bond that grows when a small group of people form a tightly knit team facing a challenge. What happens, I found, is that while the photos and adventures and discoveries are highlights, what becomes most important are your fellow adventurers. Lesson number three, I learned there is a deep respect which develops between members of a team who work together at a difficult task, making the team greater than its individual parts. 
During the last days of the expedition, we began to encounter a very special small gray bird called slate-colored solitaire. What makes this bird so special is its song. Close your eyes and imagine a wind chime made of echoing crystal, changing tones without making a tune. The call is haunting and sad. yet pure and uplifting in a strange way. During the early morning and late evenings, the rest of the jungle seemed to fall silent in respect as a solitaire song sounded through the forest and echoed under the natural arch. To me, this bird song is the essence of the call of the wild. It is beautiful without emotion. It just is, which is something I've learned about nature. As unfair and raw as it appears sometimes, it just is. No purpose, no direction, no fairness. Turning my cameras on the jungles and wildlife of the Chikibul has taught me a respect for nature that can only be realized by understanding that all these wild creatures from the most delicate butterfly to the mighty jaguar, must find food every day, must avoid being eaten or injured at any moment, and are constantly driven to reproduce or care for young. They live in the moment, all their senses finely tuned to the environment. When I hear the song of the slate-colored solitaire, I know what FCD is doing is right. Wild places are not a luxury for Belize. They are part of our soul. If we lose our wild places, I believe so will we lose part of our Belizean spirit. Lesson number four, we must respect and preserve our wild places to survive as a people, as a nation. What has my passion for adventure and exploration taught me? That I love light, but that there are two kinds of light. One kind of light allows me to create an image like this. But I've also learned that light is a metaphor for knowledge, for understanding, for respect. I believe if we Belizeans learn about this second kind of light, learn to respect ourselves, learn to respect the differences while remaining united, learn to respect all wild things and the environment, and learn to work with and build respect for each other, that we will possess the real power of light, and there would be no limits to the heights we could soar as a nation.